Thank you, Katie, for that introduction. And thank you for the MITRE team for inviting me here today. Uh, I actually thought I was going to have to start my talk by inviting everybody in from outside. I didn't realize how big the MITRE team had grown when we were doing introductions. Um, it's really a testament to the work that the attack team has done and how central it's become to this community over the last two years, really, in particular, although this effort's been going for nearly five. So a little bit about myself, uh, as Katie kind of mentioned. Uh, I started as an all-source intelligence analyst working in the Department of Defense, where I was for almost 15 years. Um, I left government service and went to Threat Connect, uh, where I was the director of research. Um, so not only did I get to work with some amazing researchers in-house, a big part of my job there was working with threat intelligence teams across industry. Uh, as Katie mentioned, I also taught at Georgetown. Um, a quick plug, if you are interested in teaching, there is a huge demand for adjunct faculty uh, members who have practical experience in this space. Um, it's an aggressive side hustle on top of your day job, I will, I will warn you that. Um, but it's a really compelling way to both give back to the community and it really helps you level up because you think a lot about how and why we do the work that we do when you teach it to others. Uh, and then this summer, um, I picked up from my DC roots and moved across the country to California to join Google's uh, Threat Analysis Group, which as Katie mentioned, is Google's in-house threat intelligence team. Um, a very important disclaimer though, uh, this talk represents my personal views uh, and not the views of Google or Alphabet, so keep that in mind as we progress through, uh, you know, all these memes. All right, so over the next two days, we are going to see a whole series of talks from practitioners that are actually using attack to improve security. And so when I was thinking about uh, creating this talk, um, I realized that we're gonna get really detailed view, lots of hands-on experience and best practices over these next two days. And so what I wanted to do was start the conference by kind of taking a step back uh, and thinking a little bit more about why we're here, the problems that attack enables teams to solve, and some of the challenges I've seen from teams who are working to implement attack in their environment. So what brings us together today? Matrices. <laughs> Matrices are what bring us together today. Uh, so quick show of hands, how many of you here in the audience uh, work in threat intelligence? A lot of hands. How many of you work in ops or as defenders? Ooh, that's a pretty good split. So for those of you watching at home, the thousands of people that Katie has told me are tuning in, uh, that's about a 50-50 split here in the audience, which in and of itself, I think, is a really compelling reason for why attack has been so successful. There we go. So this leads to a lot of questions, right? I've worked in Intel my entire career, and so I've always seen this struggle to make Intel and ops more effective together. Uh, and that leads to a lot of questions like, why do I need Intel? How do I make this work? How much is enough? I wanna take an Intel-led, an Intel-driven defense, but how do I actually do that? And so this here is my answer to the why of threat intelligence. The purpose of intelligence is to drive a decision advantage. Uh, I thought about putting out definitions here from Gartner, Forrester, even better, the joint pub. Um, but to be honest, I kind of get lost in all the dependent clauses when I look at those longer definitions of what Intel is. Plus, I thought it was a bit of a bait and switch to go from a princess bride meme to doctrine, so you're welcome. So let's unpack that a little bit. What does decision advantage actually mean? So this chart is from um, the EU Cybersecurity Agency, and, and it's busy. There's a lot going on here. Uh, but I like it because I think it helps us uh, map out what decision advantage might look like in different organizations. Um, so a couple of things come to mind here. First, now it's possible that as a threat intel team, you actually serve this whole range of customers and systems, right? And your threat intel is just radiating out from the center of the company to all of these wonderful places. Um, but what's much more likely as a team is that this is more of a choose your own adventure, right? Where you've got a couple of these different pathways um, you know, that are the definitions of who you're supporting and what define your deliverables. And then it's a painstaking process over time to establish new pathways throughout the organization uh, as your Intel team grows and matures. The second point I'd like to draw out here is that um, decision advantage can come in, in a couple of different ways, right? Our decisions can be made by people and or by systems. And it's really important for us as practitioners to understand what the requirements are for both. 
So my time in the Department of Defense, um, I was an all-source intelligence analyst primarily focused on Afghanistan and working in the Pentagon. My world was overwhelmingly what's in this top left quadrant of the slide and labeled strategic. Um, my decision makers were people, and the way they needed intelligence, it had to be delivered cogently in writing or on the spot in person. So the, the way that you work as a team, when those are the types of decision makers you have to support, and that's the kind of deliverable they need, is very different from a different type of problem. Uh, when I came into the private sector and started working with enterprise security teams, I saw something that was very different. Here, enabling systems to be more actionable was a key deliverable, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, however, one of the things I really struggled with, and, you know, especially about four years ago when I made this transition, was that overwhelmingly, this was implemented as indicators of compromise being pumped into a device, usually a SIM. Uh, and I'll be honest, I didn't really understand that. <laughs> so uh, I found that, to be, that approach to be very tactical. That information is very perishable, right? IOCs tend to have a very short shelf life. Um, and it's such a high volume that a small team could spend pretty much their entire time and effort uh, managing and curating these streams of data for relatively little decision advantage. So one of the things that I really like about MITRE ATT&CK is both that it allows us to better support those two types of decisions, uh, you know, made by people and made by systems, and that it really helps pull us up from an overly tactical view of what intelligence is. And that's pretty clutch, because the side that learns the fastest wins. So a quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with OODA loops? That is almost everybody. I get so excited. <laughs> All right, uh, so OODA loops, uh, this is a theory developed by John Boyd, who's an Air Force officer in the 1970s, thinking about aerial combat. And what his theory is is that decision making happens in these iterative loops uh, where you observe, orient, decide, and act. That's our OODA. And basically, both you and your adversary have these loops. And so the one who learns the fastest, who closes the loop the fastest, gains the advantage and is more likely to be successful. All right, so let's think about this a little bit more, right? That first O, observe, is collecting the information around you and getting your bearings. The O for orient, this was something it took me a little while I had to think about a little bit more. This is really how you analyze and process that information, right? Drawing on uh, your past experiences, your values, your cultural biases, things like that. So he's crafting this theory thinking about an individual fighter pilot in a dogfight. But if we zoom out a little bit, we can see how this would also apply to organizations. How many of us have been in a place where we've taken the same external set of data and seen two teams run with it in completely different directions? Right? The way they interpret and orient uh, is very much shaped by their organizational culture. And the way that they orient is going to have a huge impact on how they decide and how they act. Thinking, we're thinking. There we go. OK, so we've talked about how to think about OODA loops as a way to sort of measure this decision advantage. How do we know if it's working, right? This is the purpose of why we have intelligence, is to make this better, to do it faster, how do we know if it's working? What metrics can we use to think about this? There's kind of two categories of metrics here. Uh, full disclosure, this is an area I've done a fair amount of work on, so there's more presentations on this, you know, under the covers. Um, but basically, those metrics tend to fall into two categories of things, right? Measures of performance, which is what most of us think about when we think of metrics. These are the things that answer the questions, am I doing things right? Uh, they tend to be within the control of the team, uh, to measure things like, you know, how many reports did I write this month? Um, how well are my systems working? How do I make X more efficient? Um, you know, what are we analyzing? What are we finding? And these type of metrics absolutely have their place, but they tend to be overweighted in how we think about the effectiveness of intelligence. This is also where, when a lot of us get cynical about metrics, it's because we're spending too much time working towards this metric, and it doesn't really get to the, you know, the heart of the matter of how effective we're being. Um, pretty much all of us have some sort of horror story or scar tissue about a place that we worked or a person that we know where there was that metric of, to be successful, you will write five reports a month. 
Now, somebody who leads analysts, I know, if I set that as a criteria, my analysts are going to write five reports a month. Now, whether or not those reports are good or whether writing five reports a month is, in fact, the right thing I want them to do is a separate question. So you have to be careful here because while these types of metrics are important for keeping um, the team moving forward and improving your processes, if you're not careful, you can easily misincentivize the type of behavior you want your team to be taking. So where we really want to be is on the right side of the slide, talking about measures of effectiveness. These types of metrics capture, excuse me, am I doing th the right things? And so here, what we're really talking about is um, the output that the Intel team is creating is it actually changing the organization's decisions or behavior, right? This is where we're really trying to focus on that impact. So these may be things like countermeasures enacted or um, new cases that have been generated from Threat Intel, right? Where that output um, is actually making a difference in the way the security team works. But guess what? These types of metrics require a really strong partnership with the teams that we're enabling. And that can be ops, that can be incident response, it can be the execs, whoever our key stakeholders are from our choose your own adventure experience a few slides ago. Um, the measures of effectiveness are really gonna speak to how well we're working together. And that makes us really uncomfortable, right? We know this in our bones. The number of uh, threat intel types that I've seen leave an organization because they felt their work wasn't causing change, too many to count. But yet it makes us really, really uncomfortable to think that the true measure of our effectiveness is how well we are enabling others. And that means it's not entirely within our control. So what holds us back from being more effective then? Um, I think there's a cultural mismatch a lot of times between threat intelligence and ops that makes us both less effective. And I don't want to overdo this point because sometimes I think this comes across as a caricature. Um, so it's not a threat intel is from Mars and ops is from Venus or vice versa. It's not like that. Uh, but we have different frames for the way that we consume information and the timeline that we need that information to be valid. And so by absolutely no malice or um, you know, deliberate slight, it's very easy for both of us in trying to do our best um, to not make the other side effective. So what does that mean? Intel is drawn to the novel, to the unique, to the next, right? What is the next big attack? What happened here? What does this portend for the attack landscape moving forward? We live in the details. Uh, and because the details of those attacks are gonna vary, usually pretty substantially, based off of the environment that they execute in, uh, we have to be there. But if we're not careful, it kind of puts us in the position of being the well, actually people, right? We've all been there, I've been there. You know, you provide this information and what comes back is something that's so generalized that you feel compelled to say, well, actually, and provide like five caveats. Um, because it's also very important as Intel practitioners that our customers don't take the wrong takeaways and charge off in the, you know, in the wrong direction. But if we overdo it, we basically end up never giving a clear point. So I mentioned that we're living in the details. Most of the work that we're doing on these attacks and what we're publishing is retrospective in nature. So our work is highly descriptive and highly explanatory, but not necessarily super predictive going forward. And so there's, um, there's actually, believe it or not, um, a theory about theories. There's actually a whole bunch of them. Um, but what I want to point out here is this tension when you think of a theory between its diagnostic strength and it's prognostic strength. So diagnostic theories um, have a high amount of explanatory power. They're really good applied to a specific case or looking backwards. But because they're so detailed, right, they are less generalizable going forward and have less predictive strength. I would put forth that for the most part, threat intel tends to live on the diagnostic end of the spectrum in the work that we do. And that contrasts, I think, pretty sub significantly <coughs> with what operations needs to be more effective. Ops needs stability of signal in order to do their work. Um, and speaking with a number of teams that have worked to implement MITRE ATT&CK, one of the things that has struck out you know, um, really to me quite vividly is how long it takes the ops teams to build and field detections. Um, so identifying these techniques, researching the de detection, building it, testing it, deploying it, the average that I hear is closer to one per quarter per analyst. 
that has a completely different time frame than until people live on. I can't tell you basically what happened last week, let alone a quarter ago, right? So when we think about this and what we're reporting, we're over here looking at that new novel and next, and Ops is over here trying to figure out, you just gave me 15 new novel and next, what is stable here and is going to be worth the investment it's going to take for me to build these detections? So basically, in a nutshell, they need Intel to be more prognostic, whereas our strength is really being more diagnostic. So I've highlighted here a couple of areas where we want to get better as intelligence practitioners. You know, what is it that attack can help us with here in creating that decision advantage and working more effective as a team? Now, people think that we're onto something here. Right? So this is a Google Trends chart for attack as a search term, um, going back from when the framework was first introduced in May 2015 till, I'm not, I'm not too proud to say it, I made the slide last night. <laughs> so, <laughs> and what you can see here is that in 2018, right, we really start to see velocity take off um, for attack, and it just keeps going up. Um, now, in my defense, I made the slide earlier in this month, um, and at that point, 100, which is our y-axis here, and represents um, the peak popularity for attack as a search term, that 100 point was hit uh, this year in August, basically coinciding with the time that Katie and Ryan Kovar gave a talk at Black Hat, uh, you know, titled Play at Home. Um, and then I realized, well, let me go check that data again, and found that it looks like we are on track this week with the conference to create a new high. So, well done, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you can clap for yourself. That's absolutely <laughs> acceptable. <laughs> um, so this trend tells us, this trend chart tells us something that I think we all pretty much know intuitively, right? When we go to security conferences now, we're pretty much guaranteed to get at least one talk on attack. And it may be from the MITRE team itself, but oftentimes it's not. It's from other practitioners, which is really exciting and compelling about this space. But I got to say, I think Patrick Gray, uh, who runs the Risky Business Podcast, kind of said it best here. Um, the attack framework is now officially everywhere. Uh, this this uh, episode was actually about attack IQ and adversary emulation. It's actually pretty interesting if you haven't had a chance to, to go check it out. OK, so with the value here, point number one, moving up from more tactical threat intelligence. So for those of you who had first time to Pyramid of Pain reference as about 16 minutes into the conference, you win the pool. Uh, and we'll probably see this slide a couple more times over the next two days, and that's not a bad thing, right? Uh, so the Pyramid of Pain was developed uh, by David Bianco, who's at Target, uh, basically to think about the amount of pain caused to the adversary uh, when these various categories are denied to them. So earlier when I said that uh, threat intelligence you know, tends to be the way it's been defined and implemented largely in the market. Um, has, that use case has been indicators of compromise into a device. Right? We're spending too much time here at the bottom levels of the pyramid on activity that is trivial for the adversary to change. So what we want to do is move up to TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. These are much more stable. Um, the stable signal that our operators need. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to reframe the discussion. So by working at this level, we help Intel come out of that very tactical diagnostic focus, uh, diagnostic focus, and give ops the stability of signal they need to do the work that they need to do to build detections. So what does that actually look like? Also, first representation of a matrix for the day. <laughs> Uh, so I just went and opened up the attack navigator and pulled the, uh, the chart for APT28. So there's no extra sauce on this chart. Uh, just the special sauce of what the community has been able to bring together in synthesizing a body of reporting, which is pretty cool. We can have a very different discussion as a team when we're starting from here than from a handful of indicators. Um, I think that's a really important point because these types of, of matrices are an important way for us to start building consensus on what is happening and how that translates to our own operational environment. Now, a point of caution, um, it's easy to become too over-reliant on things like a matrix. And if we're not careful, uh, we introduce different sorts of bias. So 
This can be a very powerful tool for decreasing certain types of bias, namely recency bias um, and anecdotal bias. Right? If it's very difficult for us to pull up this information and look at it over a period of time, we're going to be overwhelmingly weighted towards the, th the most recent thing. Um, I don't know if hippo bias is a thing, but it probably should be, or the highest paid, a pers highest paid person's opinion. The way they define the problem becomes the way that we frame and talk about it. This can be a very powerful corrective to those types of group tendencies. But like I said, it's not without risk. If we become too reliant on this, we introduce other sources of bias, namely collection. Right? If your collection is skewed towards being only being able to see some things, you're going to have darker red on this chart uh, than others. So the matrix represents what you know. And the bigger the divergence between what you know and reality is, the less effective a tool is going to be. Um, but if we're thinking about it in that way and we're careful to that, it's a really powerful way to bring different teams and perspectives together and have that conversation. So that point might be really obvious to make, right? Like that the core of this is a common nomenclature. You know, How, why is it taking us so long to get to this point where we can do that? Um, I remember when I was at Threat Connect and we were thinking about how to get incentivized teams to do more TTP level analysis, we were having a really difficult time, and again, this was about four years ago, um, with the standardization problem, right? When we talked about TTPs, it was too qualitative and too subject to interpretation by different analysts for us to build a structured feature that would enable both humans and systems to consume that type of intelligence. And this is the problem that I think MITRE has solved in a lot of ways for us, that over the last two years, we've really seen this critical mass, I would say, um, across the community for this is how we're going to talk about TTPs. Now, if we contrast that, and think about how unique and special that is. Let's think about another part of our world, and that's adversary naming, right? Adversary naming, by contrast, is not standardized. Each vendor or producer comes up with their own uh, code name or code word. And um, sure, someone's going to say there's good reasons for that, like we have different visibility and different collection, and that may be true. Um, but one, the conversations we don't have are about how different, you know, APT28 visibility is versus Fancy Bear. We, those aren't the conversations we really have as a threat intel community. We just jam them all together. Um, and it causes a lot of pain and friction for everybody, for the threat intel analysts themselves and for everybody who's got to consume this information. Um, you know, having just joined a new team at Google, I now have yet another set of acronyms and code words that I have to layer on uh, to, the, to these other ones. Super fun, guys. So much fun. So here, I think the, di the dichotomy between how we're seeing TTPs evolve and adversary naming is really a testament to the work that MITRE does, right? It's also a testament to the community, which has invested into this framework to make it more usable and help evolve it over the last few years. Yeah, forgot the animation. There you go. That's just a handful of uh, aliases for the same group. Have fun con you know, constructing your search queries around that. All right, so common nomenclature here is so important because it enables a common operational picture. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking about the pyramid of pain that if we think about our OODA loop again in that frame, um, one of the reasons attack is so helpful is on that first O, the observe, it draws us up from the tactical, right? Our observations are at a much higher level and that's a better starting point for this next step, which is orient. Um, these matrices are a really important way to bring Intel and ops together because it allows us to map adversary activity and then translate that into how we see this play out on our own networks. Again, sounds so simple, but it's such a compelling step forward for bringing both sides of this together. And the way we orient together, again, is what drives how we decide and act. So one of the things I've noticed, though, in looking at teams that uh, have had some false starts or have struggled to get their attack implementation off the ground is that that orient phase really requires both Intel and Ops. If just one of them is trying to drive that, it's not going to be successful and it's going to struggle to stick in the organization. But wait, there's even more. So, talked about OODA loops quite a bit. Um, Attack's real Jedi mind trick here, I think, is that a framework that's ostensibly about adversary behavior really not allows you to know yourself. Um, 
And this is something that I keep running into over and over and over again every time I work with a team that is starting to implement attack. So what does that actually mean? So one of the first use cases here is improving detection and visibility. And this is really that core use case we've been talking about up to this point. When we think about how we're going to use MITRE ATT&CK, it's about improving operational defense um, and helping to get yourself out of a sort of Schrodinger's breach situation where you are both breached and not because you can't see it. Right? Um, so improving visibility is usually one of the first use cases where you're going to see value from undertaking this activity. And this is what we tend to think of when you know, we start thinking about attack. One of the most interesting talks that I've seen this year uh, was from an analyst at ING that was presented earlier at first CTI. Uh, and this was about using the MITRE framework to map Intel requirements. Now, this is something I never even thought of doing. Uh, this analyst took like the high level requirements from their executives and broke that down into the types of attacks were, that were most likely to create that and map that into a, a, matrix, a matrix. And so that gave this analyst an another layer when they were having these conversations about what adversary behavior is, what our stakeholders want, and what we see on our networks to make better decisions. I know this chart can be a little hard to see, so you know, th these different triangles are stakeholder management, source management, and tracking improving CTI maturity. So having done that, they got another bonus out of it, which is all the work they were doing to um, create intelligence reports and analysis and the work that the ops team was doing to build these detections and improve coverage on the map, they were able to cleanly map that back to program requirements, which is something else that we tend to struggle with a lot in this space. So I thought that was a pretty cool uh, use of the attack framework that I had never really thought about before. Here's another one, supporting your product evals. So uh, this is a talk that was presented here at AttackCon last year by two analysts from General Electric. Great talk, um, where they really focused on how they operationalize attack in their organization. So a lot of those early use cases we were talking about is, is the meat of it. But they also talked about how they were able to use that knowledge of where their gaps were to meaningfully change the way they did product evals. So now that I'm looking at where I direct my budget, where are my gaps? And now I have a, another basis for assessing, does this tool that this vendor is selling me actually do the things I, it says it does and that I needed to do? What an idea. All right, so you're probably thinking, you know, how do we get here? Like, you've just shown me some matrices. What is the magical alchemy that allows us to get from, you know, that, that chart to these amazing outcomes? And, I'm, and I, to me, what comes to mind is this quote by, attributed to President Dwight D. Eisenhower, that plans are worthless, but planning is everything. I say maybe because Eisenhower himself attributed this quote to something he heard in the Army. So I'm not really sure, you know, kind of urban legend, what the, you know, who the real owner of this is. And, uh, and let's be honest, the guy that planned the D-Day invasion gets to be a little bit more flippant about plans than the rest of us do. But there's some real truth here. Uh, and that is, in some ways, it's about the process and the journey, right? When you sit down to do planning, you're identifying the problem, you are identifying your assumptions, you are thinking about and weighing different courses of action. And that work, bringing people together to do that work, is really you know, the friends we made along the way, right? This is the point where, you know, what you end up facing is probably gonna look pretty different from what you planned because the adversary has OODA loops too. You know, they get a, a vote in how this unfolds. But this work leaves everybody more resilient and better able to respond to what actually manifests, even if it doesn't end up in the plan. And so I think a very similar thing can be said for attack, right? We have these matrices and they are tools but it's the discussion and the process that we're building within the team, how we communicate and how we define the problem that becomes such a powerful driving this work. Not only are we getting um, improvement in that core proposition of defending our enterprise, we're actually able to drive change across the security team and how it operates. And that is pretty cool. All right, so sign me up, right? I wanna do all of these amazing things with attack. I have full steam ahead, right? And again, uh, in interest, I put this, uh, this graphic in for Katie because she's such a huge Legally Blonde fan. So what have we learned from Elle Woods who thinks that, you know, getting into Harvard Law, like what, it's hard? Okay, so some of the challenges I've seen teams struggle with when they start to implement attack. First and foremost is the complexity. 
right? We are up to 266 techniques in enterprise attack alone. I didn't go through and look at mobile and pre-attack, I'm sorry. Uh, and many teams find themselves extending that framework even further to more appropriately fit their environments and their use cases, which is cool. Um, now, I've seen Katie tear through a report and pull out techniques, but for most of us mere mortals, this takes a while, right? The learning curve is pretty steep. So I'm extremely excited for Jackie and Sarah's talk um, where with, you know, with what MITRE's been cooking up to help reduce the complexity uh, and, and to improve adoption for new users and more experienced ones of attack. Time. Done right, implementing attack is gonna change your inputs, your processes, and your outputs. Plan on this taking at least six months to a year of sustained investment before you feel like you're really starting to get the hang of it. So if you go in thinking that in a month you're gonna have this licked, you're probably not setting yourself up for success. Now a big part of this is sort of the weight of classifying a whole bunch of data to make those matrices meaningful, right? Now the attack team has done a lot of work with the knowledge base to give you a head start but most teams are gonna to need to build off of this and layer on their own internal data, right? Your premium sources, your actually internally produced intelligence, your incidents, and understanding of how your systems map to these techniques. That's a lot of legwork. One of the things that I think is getting very interesting is that in this last two years, as we have, as a community have decided that the attack framework is how we're gonna talk about TTPs, we're starting to see greater pickup in the, in the vendor space for supporting attack. And that's really important because both it enables us to auto-classify data more quickly and at scale and consume that data more effectively. So I'm very curious to see over this next year as that starts to gain more speed, if this time to value here can be reduced. The third bit is buy-in. Um, I really enjoyed the Black Hat talk, you know, uh, the Play at Home edition where uh, Katie and Ryan Kovar used the framework of a very small team where it's just sort of one in each role and how they could get value out of attack. Um, but most of us work in an organization where more than two people are going to have to agree that we want to do this. So how do we build that buy-in and make it sustainable to get the traction that we need? So stop me if you've heard this one before. The senior threat intel analyst doesn't want to use attack because it feels like bolting on a huge other layer of work and it slows them down. The ops lead kind of loses interest after the first time they stepped through this exercise and they did all this work just to get to the same decision they knew they were going to make based off of intuition. All right, this was a lot of work to get to the same point that I thought I was going to get to. And then interest fizzles. So those concerns are valid. Um, but what we're trying to do here, right, why do we put in all this work? to get to potentially that initial same outcome that I could have gotten to much faster by just putting these two people in a room together? The answer is scale, right? That senior threat intel analyst and that ops lead don't scale. There's a finite amount of decisions the two of them can make, and they don't scale across that whole matrix of techniques. If teams were actually working effectively that way, we would not need this. Um, so what happens is you get into this space where let's say your initial OODA loop pre-attack is like this, right? And you start going through and doing all this work, and as you're learning, your OODA loop actually kind of looks like this, right? It's gonna slow you down the first time you do this, sometimes painfully slow. But what we wanna get to eventually is this. And those two people can't, can't get here. You need the whole team participating in order to get that much smaller and tighter OODA loop. And that means breaking down this problem into more manageable chunks and having a process that allows the whole team and not just the two seniors who have enough institutional knowledge to know where the bodies are buried and what approaches we've tried before hasn't worked, right? This is a way to leverage the entire team and bring them together to make those decisions. That's a pretty good sell. I think it's a pretty compelling value proposition and a way to build buy-in. Um, so if we focus on the why and the how, then the what becomes a lot easier. But central to that is managing those expectations. So understanding how long it's gonna take for us to do this and where those um, learning experiences are along the way, I think is really important to preventing that, that false start or the fizzling out of interest that you sometimes see with different teams. And one way to do this is to use the community, right? This is a very vibrant community 
uh, full of practitioners doing really interesting things. And a lot of this content is accessible. The talks that I showed earlier in, this slot, uh, in the deck, I've sent those to probably dozens of people who were struggling with how to get started um, or were thinking about a more interesting use case for attack. So take notes this, you know, these next two days, meet each other, because this is part of how you help solidify that buy-in. Having a compelling vignette from a peer team at another company can be worth everything when it comes to building buy-in. Uh, and this is a wonderful forum to, to get those stories and meet those people. So a few closing thoughts as we head off onto this two-day wonderful journey full of amazing content. We've talked a little bit today, or I've talked, uh, about you know, why we're here. Right? The purpose of Intel is to create a decision advantage. And that's not something that Intel can do alone. It really requires a partnership between intelligence and operations. You need all of your defenders working together. And as we've seen, sometimes we get there on our own individually, but not consistently. And there's some good reasons for that. And so attack is a really, really powerful tool in our arsenal to help drive that type of change across the security team by making us focused on sort of the same level of intelligence that ops needs to do its work, by thinking about how we can use that to drive other parts and processes across the security team, and thinking through some of the pitfalls and challenges that we have. It's a fair question to ask these other presenters as we go through, you know, what was your pain here? How long did this take? All of those things help us manage our expectations and build that buy-in so that the investment that we're making is stable and pays off over time. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much.